Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to this year's debut picture book buzz panel presented by the Children's Book Council. I'm Ashley Marie Morales Guerrero. I'm the director of sales and marketing at Familius. Um, and tonight we have representatives from seven publishers here to tell you all about two of their favorite debut picture books published this year. Um, first, a little bit about the Children's Book Council. The CBC is the Trade Association for Children's Book Publishers, and it works in its work encompasses creating resources for teachers, librarians, and organizing awards and staging panels that let the book community know about upcoming titles like today. Um, before we get started, just a quick note, if you desire or need closed captions for this event, you can find that feature by hovering over your toolbar and selecting the closed caption buttons. Um, starting off, we have Jen from Orca Book Publishers. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Ashley, so much for moderating. And thanks to the Children's Book Council for in the invitation. And thanks to you all for tuning in. Um, my name is Jen. I'm from Orca Book Publishers. I'm sales manager. And I want to tell you about two new books. First one is this one, Once a Bird. Uh, this is a gorgeous, gorgeous, wordless picture book that came out earlier this fall. Um, wordless picture books have this superpower, I think, um, to cross language barriers. They foster creativity and imagination, which I think is pretty cool. Um, early in the pandemic, the author Rena Singh went on a solitary walk during lockdown. Uh, she passed a field, a playground, a park, and a trail, and they all were empty. I think an experience that we are probably most of us quite familiar with. Um, and so that was kind of the beginning of a story. So in this book, we follow a robin that flies around looking for a suitable nesting spot. Um, eventually, she finds a tree in front of this apartment building and starts gathering material for her nest. I'm just going to show you a spread. Beautiful spread. Um, so then this lovely thing starts to happen. The residents of this apartment building, one by one, start to notice this Robin and what she's doing. And not only that, they start to notice each other and they start connecting. And so you've got this lovely sort of um, sense of connecting and also like to other people in the community. And you also have this lovely sense of seasonality and the importance of the natural world. So this community in this apartment building comes together and they welcome the birth of these three robins in the spring. Uh, I think this book uh, really reminds us of how, just how quiet it was at the beginning of the pandemic and the joy of reconnecting with community. Um, and it's got these gorgeous illustrations by Natalie Dion, which are exquisite and really soft. Uh, this is a quiet and meditative book, but I think it has a lot to say about nature, renewal and resiliency. And it's already received three star reviews including one from Kirkus, um, who called it refreshing, beautiful, moving, and meaningful. The next book I want to tell you about is We Belong to the Drum. Uh, this came out last spring, and this book presents um, a culturally specific solution to the separation anxiety that many kids feel when starting daycare or preschool. Orca is really well known for its books by Indigenous creators, and this one written by Cree author Sandra Lamouche and uh, Plains Cree artist Asby Wedkoff is another beautiful example of that. In this story, a child's parents um, and teacher come up with a creative way to help the child um, their ease of fears about starting daycare. And what they do is they use drumming to remind him of the love and joy he feels at Pow Wow. So it's a really great um, example, I think, of the importance of cultural connection uh, in the lives of Indigenous children. Um, the author also, which is, is a really cool fact, I think, she is a champion uh, hoop dancer. And this story was inspired by her eldest son's experience at daycare. And there is an adorable picture of him at the end of the book, which I'm just going to show you uh, right here. Oops, there he is. <laughs> Very cute. Uh, this book also includes a glossary of Plains, Tree, uh, Plains Creek kinship terms. And there is also a Plains Cree English dual language edition of, available, which I think is great. Uh, school library journal called We Belong to the Drum, an emotionally resonant story and a welcome addition to the first day of school shelves. Uh, and Booklist calls this book an upbeat story accompanied by exuberant watercolor illustrations that demonstrate the power of sharing and appreciating varying cultures. So thank you so much for listening. And I'm going to pass it off to Kevin now. 
Hello, my name is Kevin Jones. I'm a sales and marketing consultant working for uh, working with North South Books. We're delighted to be publishing a splendid debut collaboration by the incredibly talented duo of Lena Aunlauf and Vitaly Konstantinov. Genius Noses, a curious animal compendium. Um, I think it's going to be a welcome uh, addition to your young stem shelves and collections. I also think that it hits a sweet spot for young stem picture books that while it's filled with facts, Lena and Vitaly never let the facts get in the way of the fun. And who knew that uh, animal noses could be so cool? Um, stay. Uh, we learned that the stink badger of Indonesia is not actually a badger at all. It may look ferocious, but it's actually a member of the skunk family, and its main defense has nothing to do with tooth and claw. It's a powerfully stinky fluid that it expels from its rear end. We also learned that the almost blind and deaf star-nosed mole of North America relies almost exclusively on its super sensitive schnoz for navigation and food finding. That same schnoz even works underwater and helps the, the mole consume bugs in less than a quarter of a second, making it the fastest eating mammal on the planet. We also learned that an elephant's trunk is so sensitive that it can sense the presence of water six miles away. All in all, Lena and Vitaly cover 16 animal noises, noses in detailed two pages spreads and 26 additional noses are surveyed on multi-animal pages. Examples of mammals, birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish, and insects are all included. Readers will discover new facts about familiar animals such as aardvarks and antelopes, as well as knowledge of lesser known creatures like the endangered bilbies of Australia. There's a four page glossary, source notes, and a world map showing the location of the major animals covered in the text. Happily, we have already received a starred Kirkus review and a terrific review and book list from Angela Liepert. Uh, the other good news is that Lena and Vitaly have already delivered their next volume, Genius Ears, which we will publish in the fall of 2024. Genius Noses is a 64-page hardcover picture book priced at $24.95. It went on sale September 19th. We are also very proud to be publishing um, an important new book by the celebrated Iranian-American author illustrator Rashin Kariya. Rumi, Poet of Joy and Love is a lyrical picture book biography of the great Persian poet Rumi. Rumi, who is said by some to be the best-selling poet of all time, is most known for his popular quotes on love and reflection. This book introduces young readers to the Persian poet's childhood and how he became a prolific writer. Through bold and colorful illustrations inspired by 13th century Persian art, the book guides readers through Rumi's childhood, his friendship with the Sufi mystic Shams, and his eventual discovery that love is in us and in everything. We're pretty sure that this is the first picture book uh, about the iconic literary figure, and it features timeless messages of friendship, peace, and love. The story <clears throat> is very accessible to young readers and is written as more of a narrative than a traditional nonfiction account. North-South published Rasheen's first books in the United States, including her retelling of Rumi's story, The Merchant and the Parrot. Rasheen grew up reading Rumi's stories and now brings this important aspect of Iranian Persian culture 
to readers in the US. The book features a beautiful gold embossing on the cover and spine. It includes a back matter on Rumi and a special author's note from Rasheen. It's a six, a 40 page hardcover priced at $19.95. It's going on sale March 5th, 2024. Thank you all so much. And you may take it away, please, Christine. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Christine Enderly, the editorial director at Imagination Press. And Imagination Press, for you who may not know, is the children's book imprint of the American Psychological Association. So we publish books on health and mental or um, uh, mental health and wellness, um, social emotional learning, those kind of topics. So the first book that I'm presenting um, is, in my mind, what we do best. Um, it's informational fiction. It takes a very complicated um, psychological concept and breaks it down and makes it fun and um, and fantastic and easy for kids to understand. Um, and so this book is called Taco Falls Apart. Um, and I'm not gonna lie, I signed this book because of the title and who doesn't like tacos? Um, but uh, this is written by Brenda Miles. She's a pediatric a neuropsychologist. She's based in Toronto. Um, and she is just one of my favorite clever authors. Um, she can take this really fun little book, uh, story and turn it into something that is evidence-based. It's uh, founded on um, 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 a current uh, gold standard practices for treating anxiety and stress. And so what this book does is it breaks it down um, for kids that, and tells, uh, teaches children how the interplay between thoughts and feeling and beha behavior really influence everything that you do. Um, and if you can change one part of that, you can affect how you um, feel or how you behave. So the basic story is Taco. He, um, the world expects so much of him. He has to stand tall. He has to be open. He has to be strong, strong. And, um, and one day he just falls apart. He can't hold it anymore. He cracks under all the pressure of all the world's expectations. Um, and so with the help of his friend, Nacho, who is on the back cover, so I can just show you here. Nacho teaches him to make, hey, look, Taco, you just have to change how you think. And when you change your how you think, that'll affect your behavior and how you feel. So this is just a fantastic, simple little story broken down on a key fundamental um, psychological process that's very important. Um, all of our books have a note to parents at the end, which kind of talk about it serves as a, a, a um, psychoeducational piece to give the psychology behind the story um, and additional tips that um, parents might use to help their um, kids through rough spots. So this is Taco Falls Apart. Oh, and the illustrations are by Monica Filipino and she, or Filippi, I'm sorry. Um, and she, um, she put, we work with her a lot. She has this like fun, whimsical style. So it's great. So it's good year round and especially on Tuesdays. Um, so the other book that I'd like to um, present is How Are You? Verity. And this is another book that that um, it, it just gets at exactly what we do well, this inf informational fiction. So there is a, a bit of a plot in this one. It's not just all um, concept and explain in psychological principles. But this book by Megan Duffy is a she's a clinical neuropsychologist, too. She also I'm sorry, I'm using the wrong her wrong pronouns. They are neurodivergent and also um, a, um, a clinical psychologist. Um, and this book is basically at its core, a story about appreciating differences and how people think. So it's about neurodivergent, uh, diversity and divergence. Um, there is a, this super quirky character named Verity and her world looks different than ours as a, a neurodivergent thinker might see things. And she happens to um, love um, um, everything under the sea. Um, and so she has this fascination with sea creatures. And so when people ask her, how are you? She uses that as an invitation to start talking about 
sea creatures and vampire sharks and all sorts of crazy, not crazy, all sorts of things that um, that interest her, but don't really get at the question. So the story is about different ways of thinking, different thinkers, um, but also social cues that might not be apparent to um, people um, that look at the world differently than we do. Um, so it's another, it's a great book. It also has a note to parents. It talks more about um, neurodivergent thinking and um, and um, I think that's all I have to say about that book. So um, I now will pass it to Mel Schuett. Thanks, Christine. So, um, hello, everybody. My name is Mel Schuett, and I am the School and Library, Mar Library Marketing Manager at the Cordo Group. And just a quick thank you to the Children's Book Council for having us here today, and an even bigger thank you to all of you for taking time out of your day to learn about some fantastic new picture books. I am starting today off with poetry prompts, all sorts of ways to start a poem from Joseph Coelho, which is perfect for readers ages seven to nine. I have a lot to say about this book, so it's kind of hard to know where to start, but I'm going to start with the book itself. Poetry Prompts is a compendium of 40 fun and engaging prompts that help children discover how to write poems and then read them out loud. Coelho's clever prompts help boost confidence and literacy skills by channeling young readers' imaginations and creativity. Poetry Prompts is a fantastic resource for schools and home libraries alike, colorfully illustrated by four wonderful artists, Grisaya Olioko, Amanda Quardi, Georgie Burkett, and Viola Wang. School Library Journal says Poetry Prompts is an ideal big book of ebullient resources sure to, sure to promote confidence while young imaginations run wild. And Kirkus Reviews confirms the message that poetry is about having fun with words, and it comes through loud and clear. As for the author, hopefully you got a chance to catch Joseph Coelho when he was in the States during TLA and ALA earlier this year. Joseph is an award-winning poet, performer, and author, and he is the 2022-2024 Waterstones Children's Laureate. Joseph has won over half a dozen awards, including the 2019 Independent Bookshop Week Picture Book Award and the 2015 CLPE Clippa Poetry Award. In addition to his laureate duties, he, always, he also presents on Discovery Ed UK's Poetry Curriculum. He also just finished up a library marathon where he joined one library in every region of the UK for a total of 209 memberships. And he had this bamboo little bicycle that he rode around all around the UK. It was amazing. Uh, and from sort of one powerhouse to another, I'm excited to show off Kid Christmas by best-selling author illustrator of the Bear and the Piano trilogy, David Litchfield. This book is best for readers ages four to seven. And you enjoy the incredible story of Santa's very first night as Santa. So Nicky Claus works with his three uncles in the Claus Brothers Toy Emporium. Uncle Hans makes the toys, Uncle Lewis checks them, and Uncle Levi adds the magic. Each toy made at the Emporium has a special sparkle that means it will find the child it is perfect for. One day, Nikki notices a young girl with her face pressed up to the glass of the store. When she disappears, he follows her and finds her living on the streets with lots of other children, none of whom can afford a toy. Nikki vows that for one night only, every child will have a toy of their dreams. And with the help of his uncles and some flying reindeer, the legend of Father Christmas is born. This magical and heartwarming story is a true festive treat centered on kindness and generosity and looking after each other. PW's glowing review remarked on the empathy, kindness, and a good bit of magic that you can find in Kid Christmas. And Kyrgyz Reviews praised Kid Christmas for being tinged with nostalgia and glowing with candlelit fireflies, a cozy tale to counteract the Christmas gift-giving frenzy. And I just have to quickly show off. Beautiful dust jacket. Beautiful case cover. Thank you so much. And I'm going to kick it off to Sarah Merritt at Zonder Kids. Thanks, Mel. I think I'll be adding that one to our Christmas rotation at home. <laughs> uh, I'm Sarah Merritt. I'm Senior Marketing Director for Zonder Kids. We are an imprint of HarperCollins. And I'm super excited to be talking to you about a couple of books today. Uh, the first one is released a few weeks ago. It's uh, an enchanting tale uh, that's not only going to amuse children, 
but also teach them some valuable life lessons. This is The Magnificent Mischief of Tad Lincoln. So it was written by New York Times bestselling author Raymond Arroyo and has beautiful illustrations by Jackie Davis. And it, it tells the story of Tad Lincoln and his extraordinary relationship with his father, President Abraham Lincoln. Uh, and this is the second book uh, in the series, The Turnabout Tales of Nonfiction Books from Raymond. Ted Lincoln is forever getting in trouble, making mischief around the White House and annoying almost everybody but his father, the president. Tad was his father's joy and comfort amidst a brutal war, family tragedy, and the toll of holding the nation's highest office. So when Tad befriends a turkey meant to be the holiday dinner, his plea for the pet to be spared teaches Abe a lesson about mercy. It also starts the tradition of the presidential turkey pardon. School Library Journal gave this book a starred review and had this to say, a fun, well-paced, highly readable biography that pro provides a sophisticated entry point for more nuanced discussions about the complexities of leadership. This book will be enjoyed by all ages. It's not just a nonfiction biography, but a beautiful narrative about a father's love and a son's playful mischief. Switching gears now to uh, Girls of the World, doing more than ever before. This was written is written by New York Times bestselling author Lindsay Davis, who is also an ABC News correspondent, and Michael Tyler. It's illustrated by Lucy Fleming. This book encourages children to use their voices, talents, and intelligence to help the world and raise awareness of girls and all the amazing things that we can do. The book highlights all the ways that women have gone before us and have paved a way for girls today to show the world what they can do. So imagine with me a moment, a world where girls have just as much, young girls have just as much confidence as boys, where girls from preschool onward are told about women who have gone before them are encouraged to dream big about all the, the career possibilities and endeavors that exist for them and that they can do anything that they put their minds and hard work toward. This is the heart behind this book um, and what Lindsay and Michael wanted to portray. Um, it has beautiful and engaging illustrations from Lucy Fleming. Let me just show you a real quick spread here. Oops. You can see all of the diversity of the kids. And it, it's, it's upbeat and energetic and encourages young girls to make their voices and dreams heard, um, speaking up for themselves and their choices and make real what they feel in their hearts. Work hard to get the knowledge that they crave, speak up for how they feel, and to make right the things in the world that are wrong. The text reads very poetic and like a building rallying cry for girls everywhere to live their biggest, brightest, best life. And now I will uh, hand it over to Tom. Thanks, Sarah. Uh, my name is Tom Rialli. I'm the President and Chief Operating, Operating Officer at Brown Books Publishing Group. And the first book I'd like to talk about tonight is Alethea Ramirez Was an Artist by Violet May. Um, you may know Violet from her work on Let's Be Friends and Babies Around the World. Um, she's a best-selling author and illustrator. This book follows the life and art of a child who unfortunately was killed in the Uvalde school shooting um, here in Texas. When Violet saw the news, she was moved and she created portraits of each of the children and sent them out. And Alethea's parents got in touch with her and thanked her for the tribute and noted that Alethea herself had been an artist. They began exchanging information and sharing Alethea's art with Violet. And Violet went back and said, would you consider allowing me to do a book about your daughter to help raise money for a scholarship fund that they were, they were setting up for Alethea? And that's exactly where this project went. Included um, is really just a, a celebration of this girl's life and her love of art and why art is so important to us um, as, you know, as creatives and as just, and, and as children and how we use art to express our world. Um, included within the art is a bunch of Alethea's original drawings, which Violet has painstakingly recreated and integrated within um, the digital texture on this landscape. Uh, toward the end of, at the end of the book, there is an author's note that discusses, um, you know, what happened to Alethea and there is a conversation at, within the text about when an artist dies, um, their art within, lives within our, all of our hearts forever. Um, at, and you know, there is an opportunity there uh, within the author's note to begin a conversation with children 
about what happened, or there's an opportunity not to, but just to leave the story where it is relative um, to the child's life and, 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 and what she did give to us while she was here. Um, so it is 1799, uh, Kirkus Reviews called it a, a heartbreaking tribute to a talented young artist. Second book I'd like to talk about is um, Bing Bang Chugga Beep uh, by Bill Martin Jr. and Michael Sampson, illustrated by Natalie Beauvoir. Um, this one really just kind of speaks or really sings for itself. I mean, it's pretty much this old car, it is blue, yellow, red, and purple too, with a bing bang chugga beep, bumping here and there. This old car goes everywhere. So, um, you know, during circle time, you've got 14 spreads of that. And <laughs> as you walk through the book, Toward the end uh, is a reveal that the car is actually belongs to a boy named Charlie, and that Charlie, the car is Charlie's toy. And um, so it's whimsical, it's fun, it, it encourages, as does all of the material that's ever come from, from Bill Martin Jr. and from his collaboration with Michael Sampson, it encourages a joy of reading, it enhances uh, rhyme, rhythm, repetition um, within early literacy, and it's uh, it, it, it provides a uh, uh, also an entree into song practice for the kids. Um, these books retail at $17.99 for Aletha Ramirez and $18.99 for Bing Bang Chugga Beep. Bing Bang Chugga Beep also received a starred review from Kirkus, uh, and where um, it was noted that uh, Beauvoir's watercolor collages rendered I mean, in a cheerful palette channel Eric Carle. Young children will love everything about this book and will soon be reading it to anyone who will listen. And with that, Ashley, I'll bring it back to you. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I've introduced myself once before, but again, I'm Ashley. I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing with Familius. Um, and here at Familius, we have a mission to help families be happy. So we try to create books that will help um, families create conversations with their children or teach them a lesson. Um, the first book that I have today is The Littlest Weaver. Um, so this is a debut book by Robin Hall with illustrated by Stella Lim that tells the story of Laurel, who you hear, see here on the cover. Um, she is a weaver in the Appalachian Mountains, and she, um, with her father, create beautiful rugs that tell stories. Um, so one day in their little town, a man comes by himself and never leaves his home. Um, so Laurel notices this and she's trying to figure out why this lonely newcomer doesn't like to leave his home. Um, when one day she notices that there are toys in his home, but there are no children. Um, through the story, Robin learns, or Laurel, learns about grief um, and about friendship and about community and how reaching out to someone when they're having a hard time can make a huge difference in their life. Um, Laurel decides to weave a story for the newcomer about his family um, and gives him the gift of a memory woven in this beautiful tapestry. Um, the author, Robin Hall, is also a weaver, so she has created resources for teachers and parents to teach children about the craft of weaving. Um, that Those resources also include um, guided questions and information to talk about the story and talk about grief with children. Um, she will be featured in several arts and crafts magazines in January, talking about weaving and passing the craft on to children, um, and particularly talking about um, the art of weaving tapestries with stories in them. So we're really excited about this debut book um, with Robin and just teaching children a little bit about crafts, as well as teaching them about grief and friendship. Um, the second book I have is a different format than anything we've seen today. This is Hear Them Roar. So Hear Them Roar is a sound panel book um, that teaches children about 14 endangered animals from around the world. So each spread has some information about the animal, including quick facts here in the corner <laughs> that show what level they are on the endangered um, species list and how um, they are at risk of being extinct. Um, so it also tells children about the area in which the animal lives and a little bit about why these animals are becoming extinct and what we're doing to stop it. So each animal has a coordinating sound button and you can literally hear them roar. <laughs> so the kids can um, hear the animal make noise 
And as you've seen, parents can push it a second time or teachers can push it a second time to turn off that sound. Um, the sound panel does have a screw on the back that has an on and off switch. So if you decide you've heard enough of these animals roaring, you can turn them off. Um, the intro to the book does also include a little bit of information about how animals are listed on the endangered species list um, and just information about why more and more animals are becoming extinct. Um, Bath Matter includes more resources for research, or if you want to delve deeper and create a lesson plan, there's tons of resources here um, to pull from and teach more about all of these endangered animals. Um, yeah. So those are my two books. Um, we do have some questions that came in when everybody registered. And um, so we can kick it off with those questions. And for the panelists, feel free to hop in if you have an answer. Um, the first one that I think does come um, from, or it does apply to one of the books that we've heard about today, folks are asking, what are different ways to present wordless books to kids? So I think, Jen, you had a wordless book. You might want to take this one. Sure. Um, yeah, to be honest, wordless picture books are relatively new for ORCA, but I would say that, um, you know, we're getting feedback in terms of people using them for, um, like, bridging barriers in terms of language, speaking to people speaking different languages, that they work in that sense. Also, kind of, as, as you know, what I talked about briefly in my little presentation, my pitch, um, that idea of uh, having the kids really being able to um, use their imaginations and be creative in sort of like talking about the story and how I guess maybe one thing that you could talk about or way you could use them is to sort of um, remind kids or introduce them to the idea of the different interpretations of a story and how we all can be reading different things into the story and how that's really wonderful and, and I think sharing that is so important. So I would say that those are two things kind of off the top of my head. Um, yeah, I just think that I'm really excited that we're doing them. I hope we do more uh, because I just think that they um, are really quite wonderful in their ways of sort of, I think that they also like parents and caregivers might like them too because they take a little bit of, um, uh, it can be more interactive because there's a little bit less pressure for the parents too is always having to, 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 to be the reader. So I think that that's a nice thing too. But um, yeah, that's kind of off the top of my head. I don't know if anybody else has anything they might want to add, but hope that gives you some ideas. Oh, that's great. Um, another question that we had um, was whether or not any of these titles have been translated um, into specifically Spanish, but we could talk about other languages as well. Um, and also how soon after the English publication does this usually happen? I can jump in and say it depends on the title and it depends on the publisher and when we can get rights to things. Um, I don't believe that either of our titles has been translated into Spanish, but I would have to double check. Um, but like I said, you, that comes at different times for each publisher. I would be happy to check though and respond in person to that person. If I can jump in, we're planning on doing a Spanish edition of Rumi probably in 2025 if uh, if, if if our desired translator can squeeze in the uh, assignment. Yeah, for us it's um Right now, I'm working on an opportunity with a curriculum publisher, and they've requested 15 of our titles in English and Spanish. And if we do that, we'll be doing those in a block and then offering them and reserving the Spanish trade um, business for ourselves and our partners overseas. So I agree with Mel. It really depends on the specific business publisher title, you know, whatever, all of the above. Yeah, we're doing something similar at Familius. We're slowly translating titles as they come out. Um, but we do have one that's supposed to publish in both languages next year. So keep an eye out for that. Um, another book or another question that has come up is what do you think is the greatest challenge currently facing picture books? Uh, 
anyone feel free to jump in on this one. I would say visibility, maybe. It's a very crowded space. And it's definitely on publishers to make sure that librarians, that we're updating like our metadata and making sure that you guys are able to find our titles as easily as possible. Um, but maybe it's, it's a crowded space. And so making, you know, it's hard to find new ways of, you know, telling similar stories and making sure that we're being um, as inclusive as possible. Yeah, I, I think that the brick and mortar retailers have been a great challenge. In particular, the the new uh, buying philosophy at Barnes and Noble has, you know, we've we've lost an opportunity there that uh, you know that they're buying fewer new picture books, um, and we're missing it. I mean, we sort of understand certainly the philosophy and the fact that they're trying to have a new smaller footprint which means not quite so many titles but but we miss them we miss them very much anybody else have an answer to that or we can move on to the next question okay um so a question came in with our RSVPs about how to add more culturally and linguistically relevant books to libraries and schools. Um, I think a starting point is to get more <laughs> books published, but does anybody else have any suggestions? Well, with libraries and schools, I mean, the, especially where we are, where we're based in Dallas, um, there's so much sensitivity and librarians are under so much in, an incredible amount of pressure relative to acceptance of titles that they're bringing in. And so there's really a, a I view a battle going on right now about access, you know, having books be accessible to everyone who needs them um, and, and, and have the topics within the books be as open as they should be. And that's really where you know, it, it's been a concern for us. So how we go about that and it, it definitely factors into our title selection and making sure that we're bringing you know things forward that just become really difficult for someone to object to in any way um and doing it in a way that you know encourages as much inclusivity as possible we live in a plural society um, we just published a separate book but we just have a book out now called all kinds of kids that just you know show different families in different lights and and um you know if, if people decide to you know reject a title for that's uh, that's directed for children because they don't feel that the content's appropriate that's fine for themselves but um, I really feel for the librarians who are just under a ton of pressure right now the one question that just came into the chat was are or will there be picture books for children with special needs you know, we talked about a couple of them here, so they might have missed them. If you guys want to talk about them again really quickly. I can jump in. Um, we publish a lot of books in this area, you know, um, uh, you know, books for different, different kind of learners, uh, learning differences, um, special needs. We have um, books on ADHD and um, dyslexia and um, all sorts of topics like that. So that that's part of who we are and our mission. Um, we try to um, um, publish books for everyone. And that's just a range of kids and a range of thinkers. Um, and uh, we don't shy away from any topics. We just, we bring that in, we embrace that. So, um, and not only do we, um, publish books on those topics, we try to have um, a genuineness about the book. So we'll have an author who's new or di di divergent that's publishing on that topic, or or even maybe a school counselor that works with the uh, special needs kids or, or something like, you know, that are really tied into those communities. So um, we have a lot of books. I mean, in, in a lot of ways, we aren't necessarily a front and back list publisher. We just have like a big list of books. So um, chances are we have a book on that. It might just have been published a couple of years ago, but it'll eventually find its way um, into the world and to fill the need. 
that someone's looking for it. So, um, and it, in particular, the uh, 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 Brilliant Bee is the book that we wrote or that we published with the, the protagonist it has dyslexia and she is, um, and even everything about that book was very thoughtful. The, the, type, the typeface is really accessible. Um, that's another thing that we do with our books, regardless of the topic, we make sure that the type is accessible for all readers, emerging readers, and plus kids that have difficulty um, parsing out those letter those letters. So, um, so yes, that's kind of our jam. Awesome. So another question that we have from our RSVP list, and I think everyone could answer this. Um, but what would be your ideal picture book? What would it include? What would it be about? What is your dream picture book right now? Well, I'd like to guess. I'm unmuted, so Tom has to go first. <laughs> I said I'd like the guest to answer that. That's what I want to know what they what they're. You know, what, what are you guys looking for? <laughs> Tell us what what books we should be taking on and publishing. a fun question. Yeah, so we're getting a couple of answers. It looks like folks are looking for diverse books. Um, yep. Children of color. I have kids. Great suggestion. Um, so we do still have some time. So if anybody here has a third book they want to present, um, we have the time to do it. So if you have one nearby and you want to hold it up and talk about it, looks like Mel is first. <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> Did I get to it first? Well, I'm excited because it's also a sound book. So we're talking about two sound books on this call. Um, so this is a so story orchestra, The Planets. Um, hopefully everyone has heard of the story orchestra series. It's super fun. Um, I'll, I'll go more into detail about this book. Um, it, this one is a good housekeeping best kids book award 2023 winner. So very excited. Uh, and in this one, discover the spellbinding magic of the planets. Uh, it's a musical book. Um, it's based on Gustav Holst, most famous, one of his most famous suites. And it's very similar. I'm sure that the microphone won't pick it up. So I'm not even going to bother, but each spread we're traveling through space and each spread has a button. Um, so that you can listen to part of the score. There are 10 buttons in total, so 10 excerpts from the book or from the, the suite. And at the back, uh, you'll find a short biography of the composer with some details about his composition of the planets, as well as a glossary uh, with some musical terms. And then you can replay all of the music at the back, uh, which has more information about each of the excerpts. So that's the Story Orchestra Planets, and that is out now. So check it out. Very cool. Um, I saw Jen, did you have one also? <laughs> sure. I changed it up the last minute. Just um, I wanted to tell you about Lost Inside My Head by Vig. This just came out this fall. And just um, when you're talking about um, special needs, neurodivergent, neuro neurodiversity, this is a really wonderful book written by an author and illustrator. Um, and it is written from um, his own personal experience. It's loose loosely based on his experience as a kid growing up um, pre being diagnosed with ADHD. So it's just an awesome sort of idea, like you can get into the head of someone with ADHD. And it looks at all of the challenges that he faced, you know, with teacher thinking that he's being lazy because he can't focus, um, trouble that he had with communicating with other people, kind of organizing his thoughts, but also really shows his incredible resilience and what he came up with in terms of um, adapting to things and kind of coming up with his own way of looking at the world. And also, I think really importantly, he realizes that it is um, not a bad thing. It's in fact a gift to be able to see the world in his own special and unique way. So I just, this is a wonderful book. I'm really excited about it. I just wanna show you one spread um, quickly, which I think is quite powerful. And this is just sort of um, his, interpretation of all the, the all of the thoughts that are kind of coming in at him and attacking him so definitely check that one out lost inside my head thanks uh, Kevin I saw you switch your book <laughs> well Gustav Holst is pretty esoteric but I think we can 
we at North South are going to out nerd you. Um, Ludwig and the Rhinoceros is, is safe to say is the only picture book based on a conversation between Wittgenstein and his mentor, Bertrand Russell. And uh, the good news is that it's actually lots of fun, not just nerdy, but, but it is uh, uh, by two German authors, uh, a German author and a uh, terrific German design team who uh, work under the name Golden Cosmos. Um, and it's lots of fun. Just out now. Um, anyone else have a book? I can go. Oh, can I go? Okay. Yeah. All right. If it, if this is an out nerding contest, I got the big brain book. So this is actually, it's not a picture book. I mean, it's illustrated, um, but it is a primer for kids um, about your brain and all the wonderful things they can do. And it is the, every chapter is based on a, um, a question and they're fun questions like, why can't you tickle yourself? Or why does my heart rate was, race when I'm scared? Or um, why do you need to sleep? Um, and it's all these um, like fun, kind of fun, like kid questions, but then we go into the neurology and the nurse, ner um, uh, neuroscience behind those things. Um, so it's written by a, a neuro a neuropsychologist. Um, there's like labs inside it at the end of each chapter there's like a, a lab that you can do at home that are kind of fun there's a feature called pick your brain which is like a, a additional information based on current research it's just a really fun um neuropsych book that um well i saw someone the ages are probably like 9 10 11 years old um and uh so this was my uh, leanne boucher um it, uh, this was her debut book and I'm doing a couple other books kind of along these same topics. Um, and if you want to know why you can't tickle yourself, there's one part of your brain that processes um, touch, only touch that's unexpected. And then there's another part of your brain that processes that experience um, as pleasant or unpleasant. So you can't trick yourself to an unexpected touch because you know you're going to do it because there's another part of your brain that's making you do that. So that's why you can't tell yourself anyway. So. Great. Anyone else have another book? Yeah, I've got one. Just... Oh, yeah. go ahead, Tom. Oh, sorry, Tom. <laughs> I'll go quick. This is, so this is a preview of one that's to come out in 2024. This is, um, May 2024, it's Race to Kindness. So this is written by Time, um, the 2021 Time Kid of the Year, Orion Jean, um, and illustrated by uh, Darshika Varmus. And this, so he he won the Time Kid of the Year because he um, has a nonprofit where he donated half a million books <laughs> to his community. So um, this book is all about uh, ways that we can show kindness to others. So it's as simple as inviting a friend to play on the playground or um, bigger like inviting a, a new family or someone that doesn't have anywhere to go on a holiday to your dinner table. So um, it's about all of the ways that we can encourage um, kids to be kind and to show kindness to others. So we're really excited about this book launch. Um, Orion, Jean and his family are um, just incredible. And he's out speaking across the country. He's 12 years old and he's out speaking across the country to large groups of educators and librarians already. So um, it's definitely one to watch and he's one to watch. So I hope you check it out. Um, and yeah, just real quick, thank you. So um, Single the Clinic Act, uh, people were asking in the comments about uh, bilingual books. Um, this is uh, Cinco El Gato de la Clinica, and this is about uh, a cat that was in a clinic in Honduras where the author was. It's a perennial backlister for us. This is our 10th anniversary edition. Um, it's done really well. It's presented extremely traditionally and done so on purpose where the text is, um, is, is verso and illustration is framed recto so that the English and Spanish can be very clearly seen one above the other and compared in, in comparative text. It's 1695 and it's, as I said, it's been selling with us for years, so. Very cool. Okay, so it looks like we have one last question. And the question is about marketing. Um, Jennifer says, we're getting more and more adults who are defaulting to books based on TV characters. 
which has its place, but ideas on encouraging families to go beyond that um, to more literary titles. I would just, I know Mel says she has an answer. I do, and I'm hoping that my computer doesn't crash because it's doing something strange on the side here. This is something that came up on the Children's Book Council graphic novel panel as well. Um, basically, like, how do we transition kids from, like, watching TV and watching characters there to reading books? And really using those, like, characters and the tropes in those books is such a great sort of jumping off point for finding, like, like things, you know, like if they're enjoying uh, uh, an anime was the analogy that we use, draw them to that manga and have them start with that manga and start reading out from there. So sort of finding like the tropes and stuff that they enjoy and the understanding the characters that they're looking for and sort of trans looking for like the book versions of those stories. Yeah, I have, what I have been encouraging folks to do is to get their kids watching either read alouds on YouTube or books so that they can get into the stories, get used to reading along, and then you can move to the physical book that they enjoy on TV. Um, and it's been very successful with my friends and their kids. So definitely suggest that for other folks. Does anybody else have any suggestions here? For us, it's really just making sure that we're selecting material that in, that engenders joy in reading. You know, when when the kids respond to the text, no matter who it is, you know, just ensure that it it, be, it becomes popular, regardless of the fact of whether it's based on their favorite character or not. It's, it's it starts with the content for us. So it looks like those are all our questions. Um. To our panelists, um, does anybody have any last words before we end this? Just a big thank you. Yes, very much. Yes. Thank, you. thank you. Happy reading. Very cool. Well, thank you everyone for attending and our amazing panelists for speaking about their books. Um, that is the end of our panel. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.